Are we ready for the future of technology? A question which I'm sure is on the mind of many, particularly when considering the three areas which I'll be covering today, namely artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and biohacking, all of which have seen an explosion of growth in the last three years. If we look back at the 2004 film, iRobot, I'm sure many will remember the dangers associated with Vicky and the fear of sentient robots. Today, however, that fear is becoming a reality with driverless cars, robot-run hotels, and computers that are able to predict human behavior. But what do we need in order for those computers to be able to predict those behaviors? Well, we need data, and a lot of it. If we look at the amount of data that we're generating today, we're generating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every single day. And to put that into perspective, if we were to represent one gigabyte of data with one liter of water, we'd have enough water to refill the River Thames every single day. In the last two years, we've generated more data than any other year previously combined. And that's a trend that's expected to grow exponentially over the next few years. Computers today are already, ready, already using the technology to make it easier to understand us and understand what we do in our daily activities. As a result of this, we've come to an important point for humankind, and that point of inflection is something that we have to consider. The question isn't whether the so-called rise of machines is coming, but rather, are we ready for it? If we look at artificial intelligence, I grew up in the 90s and was seemingly interested by the far-fetched and theoretical ideas behind the technology. But today, already companies are making use of this technology every single day, understanding us better than we ever could before. As a result, companies are able to use data that they're learning from the artificial intelligence to predict trends in behavior quicker than any human analyst ever could. But what sort of companies are using this technology? Is it just small, innovative startups, or are large corporates using them as well? Well, it'll come as no surprise that the likes of Apple and Google have been snatching up artificial intelligence for the past few years. But those with the skills are already looking elsewhere and starting their own companies. As a result, we're seeing interesting companies and technologies developing, from robots that are teaching themselves to walk and solve specific tasks. But artificial intelligence can also help those that use Tinder, and I'm sure many in this room will know what Tinder is. The creator of Tinder created, now, uh, created an algorithm called Tinderbox, an algorithm that uses facial recognition software to understand your preferences in people before swiping through an application for you. As a result, it was able to create matches and establish the first line of communication with the person. The creator of the algorithm himself never actually spoke to the people on the application and was even able to score a few dates from what he was doing. So it just goes to show you that you never know who you're talking to when using social media platforms. So we've come to an important point of inflection for artificial intelligence. The next step will to see computers that can think, act, and develop like humans. And although leading experts would argue we're at least 10 years away from that point, I think it's fair to say that the groundwork is very much underway. With the uh, form of artificial intelligence continuing to develop, I think it's something that we need to consider. And if you think and ask me when the formative moment of artificial intelligence were to arrive, I think there's a strong argument to say that artificial intelligence is already here. With universities creating specialized degrees in artificial intelligence, and data scientists training to understand the massive amount of data that we're generating every single day, it's quite easy to see just how quickly the space is evolving. NetExplo, a company in Paris, carried out a report last year that saw three years ago only one in 10 startups spoke of artificial intelligence as part of their product. Today, that number's risen to three in 10 and will only continue to grow. But what does that mean for us? Well, I think the first thing that we need to think about is how we're going to make use of these technologies. The most important thing for us is to make sure that we do it in an ethical way and prevent the future of artificial intelligence from becoming the next nuclear arms race between countries around the world. But artificial intelligence isn't the only space that's exploding at the moment. We're also seeing the growth of another technology, quantum computing, which has aided and developed artificial intelligence for the past few years. As a result of this technology, we've seen faster processing speeds and the storage of data has increased exponentially. But that's something that we need to consider as well. A few years ago, we were looking to the likes of Windows XP and Windows Vista, and storing our data on things like 500 megabyte hard drives. But already, those with the skills are looking to take artificial uh, quantum computing to the next level. 
And the way in which they do that is through the use of quantum computing or qubits. So what exactly are qubits and how do they work? Well, put simply, today computers operate in binary, and that's zero or one. Qubits are able to find a state where both of those places can be enjoyed at the same time. So if we look at an example where ice cream were to be the case and gave the computer a choice of a scoop of vanilla ice cream or chocolate ice cream, today computers would be forced to make the choice of one or the other. But quantum computers are already able to find that state at whereby both scoops of ice cream can be enjoyed simultaneously, which has increased the speed of processing power and, if proven, would lead to revolutionary production computer processing power quantum computers, superconductors, and more. But quantum computing isn't just increasing processing power. The other space that we need to consider is storage. Today, we're generating huge amounts of data, and we need to find a way to store the data that we're using. At the moment, data centers are being set up across the world. And to give you an example, a data center has been set up just for this university, which goes to show that everywhere you go, there are an increasing number of data centers. Surely there must be a way to store this data more efficiently and process the data quicker than we are at the moment. Well, companies such as D-Wave and NASA are doing such a thing. They're creating quantum computers whereby they can be stored in innovation labs around the world, and if the theory is proven, would be able to increase the processing speed and space forever. That said, at the moment, we haven't been able to prove the theory behind quantum computers. So at the moment, it's just a theory. That said, in the future, if we do get to the point where quantum computers are actually usable, we would fundamentally change the space forever. One thing we are seeing, though, is the way that we're storing data changing fundamentally. And the way that we're doing that is through the use of DNA. Imagine being able to store the entirety of Google's data in a single gram of DNA. That's exactly what a company and group of universities in Switzerland are currently working on. If they're able to prove this theory, we'd be able to move the theory from data storage and large data centers to a microscopic level, which is something that we've never thought of being able to do. As a result of this, quantum computing would fundamentally change the processing space forever. The most important thing to think about here is how we could use this data. And one thing to take into account is if we do start doing this, what would that mean for us? If quantum computers are being used and we are storing data on quantum computers in the form of DNA, who would the DNA belong to? And as a result, would we essentially be looking to farm humans to use their DNA for data storage? And if that was the case, who would that data belong to? We've seen a huge amount in the growth of technology, and that's something that we need to consider as the years go on. But there's one other area that I'll be focusing on. Before I do this, I want you to think about your laptop. And now think back to the first laptop that you ever had. If you tried turning that on today, how long would it take to load? And would you get frustrated with how long it takes to load? I tried turning on my MacBook Pro just a few weeks ago and got frustrated at how slowly it loaded. And if we were able to prove the theory behind quantum computing, we'd revolutionize the space forever. We'd see computers grow much more quickly and we'd be able to use technology at light years faster than we can do today. And with the use of integrated artificial intelligence, we'd be able to make searches faster than our own human mind can. The thing we need to consider, though, is what this can lead to for humanity. The question I want to ask is, are we blurring the lines between humanity and biology? The final area that I aim to cover is biohacking, an area which is something that's exploding at the moment. We've seen growth in a number of areas, and a number of companies are already beginning to operate in the space. One area that I want to focus on in particular is the use of technologies to understand early detection systems for cancer, STDs, and other illnesses. With transhumanists and scientists aiming to revolutionize the space in which we use technologies and make use of these technologies by implanting them in our systems, how could we use these to benefit us as humans? Well, one company that's doing such a thing is Hoop. And Hoop is the scene as the future for STDs around the world. Today, Hoop can be used to early detect STDs and also tell people whether they suffer from an STD. All it needs to do is you need to place that ring on your finger it will take a sample of blood and will quickly and discreetly be able to transfer to your phone if you have an STD. If you do, you'll be pointed in an area to the nearest medical center. Something important to consider here is countries like Kazakhstan and Mexico, as well as Russia, where it's seen as embarrassing to have such an STD, but where there are a number of outbreaks that are higher than anywhere else in the world. 
the team at Hoop can quickly, reliably, and discreetly tell their customers whether they suffer from such a disease. But on a more superficial level, the technologies that are being used in the United States. In the United States, people are implanting RFID implants into and under their skin in the form similar that we see to an Oyster card. So to put that into perspective, imagine traveling around London and never even needing to take an Oyster card out of your pocket. You simply have a chip under your skin and you can move around the city. Now that's something that I personally find quite scary, but also interesting at the same time. Although this is simply applied in daily life for those people, something that's just been released is a way in which to make this fundamentally different. A similar technology that's being used is in the use of guns. Today we're seeing mass shootings and shootings all around the world taking place, meaning that the black market is making it easier for people to find weapons and to kill people around the world. Something to consider here is if you had this technology underneath your skin, the technology could be applied to weaponry, meaning that only those that belong to the guns would be able to fire the weapon. So you wouldn't be able to fire a weapon unless that gun was particularly triggered to that ID, meaning that black market weapons would no longer have a use. But something you need to consider here is the impact that this can have on us as humans. Are we really blurring the lines between technology and humanity? Finally, the other area that I want to talk about is the use of nanotechnologies in the body. A computer company in the United States are already working and testing a product that could be used to develop and repair white blood cells in the body, as well as unblock arteries in and around your body, making sure that you don't suffer from any cholesterol problems and it can be done so in a harmless and pain-free way. This company are already working on the idea, they've developed the product and they aim to have it in hospitals all around the world by 2020. So what does this mean for our future? Have we come to a point where humanity is at its new inflection point? Are we at the next evolutionary step for humankind? And if we are, what does that mean for us? Are we moving away from bio biological towards ro robotical? And if we are, what will that do for us in the future? I'm going to touch on the last areas and round everything off by understanding what's brought us to the point that we are today. I'm sure many of you remember the internet, and 50 years ago the internet was just used already by not many people around the world. But today, 50% of our daily activities, as I've already mentioned, is spent online. As well as that, I'm sure many in the room will remember the first ever mobile phone coming to market. And if we compare that to the mobile phones that we see today, they're fundamentally different, and they've advanced rapidly over the years. So what's been driving this growth, and what has led to this change in technology? Well, I think the big question we have to ask is whether we're perhaps smarter than we were 200 years ago. Or are we using technologies that have meant that, as a result, one advancement in one area, the symbiotic growth leads to advancements in another? Well, personally, I'd argue that the latter is true. Because although we've seen breakthroughs by the like of Edison and Einstein, who laid the groundwork and fundamentals for the world we live in today, it's been the innovators, scientists, and futurists that have built the world that we live in now. As the innovators of the future, we still see cranes towers towering above us, and we find it easier than ever to understand the move towards technology. The question I have for you is if we see the world changing as we know it, and we're moving towards a new formative moment in technology and humanity, what will your formative moment in technology be, and how will you help prepare the world for the humanity that's on its way? Thank you.